And so let nobody ever say scientists are complacent. They know everything. They've, they've got everything tied up. That's what scientists at the end of the 19th century rather did. The 20th century was an awful lesson in, in um, not doing that. So um, yes, science is going to be deeply, deeply mysterious. Um, I've forgotten what else. I, um, I was going to say something. Um, anyway, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> OK, my final question to you is, is a bit of a challenge, really. Um, in The God Delusion, you consistently refer to two different possible explanations for various things, one being a crane, one being a sky hook. And I have to say that for me, those, those, that terminology doesn't work terribly okay. well. I find the two actually quite confusing. Okay. Right. To me, a crane, if I imagine a building crane, it feels terribly like a sky Yes, hook to that's me. a good point. Um, OK, the, the terminology is not mine. It, it's Dan Dennett, the philo philosopher Daniel Dennett. And uh, what he means by a sky hook is an explanation which is sort of like a great hand coming out of the sky and fiddling with things. And you're left without an explanation for where this great hand comes from. So God is a sky hook, fairies are sky hooks, spells, incantations, um, wizards and witches and warlocks and, and, and turning frogs into princes. Um, none of that has any kind of explanation. It's all, it's all done by sky hooks. And when a fairy tale allows you to wave, wave a magic wand and make things like that happen, that's a sky hook. God's a sky hook. Uh, OK, that's sky hooks. A crane is the opposite of a sky hook. A crane is an explanation which really does elevate. A crane really does explanatory work. Evolution by natural selection is the crane par excellence. Because evolution by natural selection starts with primordial simplicity and works up by slow and gradual, intelligible, understandable degrees to ever-increasing levels of complexity until you reach levels of complexity that couldn't conceivably happen by luck. Skyhooks are a kind of um, inadequate rationalization of luck. A crane is a true explanation which really does work up gradually. And I think Paula's problem is that if you think about a crane, there is a, there's a hook hanging down, down from yes, the sky. Exactly. And so that, I think Dan Dennett's terminology from that point of view is, is unfortunate. So perhaps we should substitute, what do you think, uh, what are those things that farmers have that, that, that um, um, a forklift, no, yeah, a, a, um, a um, an elevator <laughs> that where you, where you toss hay onto a, a sort of moving ramp. An, an escalator. Escalator yes, would be good. Escalator OK, we don't have sky hooks and cranes. We have sky hooks and escalators. Okay, and what we need is an escalator. Yes. Um, and natural selection is a, is a superb example of, of, an, of an escalator. And that, coming back to the really point that's been coming out throughout our, our, our discussion, the problem with God is that it's a sky hook. And the advantage of evolution by natural selection is that it's an escalator. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We're going to move to a period of questions and answers now. So if, if I could have the lights up so I can see the audience, that's fantastic. The gentleman at the back, just, just in the middle, about five rows, rows forward. Can I go? You can. <laughs> Professor Dawkins, um, can I just take up the, uh, the point about panspermia and, and Leslie Organ and uh, Francis Crick? Um, my understanding is that uh, spectroscopic studies have identified an awful lot of organic molecules out there in space. I'm not sure what I mean by that, but I hope you do. Um, what, what conclusions, I mean, can we draw any conclusions from that, except there's some chemistry going on out there, or are these molecules residues of chemistry that's gone on somewhere else? I don't have a feel for what it actually might mean. I'm trying not to read anything into it. Y like yes, I, I, I think I, if you mean can we draw the conclusion that this is, the, this is a residue of extinct life forms or something, I d unfortunately we can't do, do that. Yeah. I think what it means is that it's rather easier to make organic chemicals in the universe than perhaps had once been thought. And it had once been thought perhaps that, that even the making of organic chemistry on this planet was a rather rare event. Now from, at, from analysis of actually not, not just spectroscopic but also uh, meteorites, um, that there, there, there's a lot of organic chemistry about, or organic chemistry simply meaning the chemistry of carbon. 
So there, there's a lot of carbon chemistry. And that means that when we're talking about the primeval soup on this planet, which is, which is a soup in which there are, or in which there are postulated to be, organic chemicals, that becomes an easy thing to postulate because there are organic chemicals all over the universe. It still remains difficult to postulate the origin of life, which is the origin of the first self-replicating uh, molecule. But at least we've got a lot of organic chemistry, so the, the finding you're talking about um, makes, it a, a, makes the problem a bit easier. Okay, thank you. And our second question over there. Um, Professor Dawkins, may I draw you a little bit on your book, The God Delusion, which in many ways underpins <laughs> the discussion that you've been having this morning. Now, in the preface to the paperback edition of that book, you acknowledge that there are what you call sophisticated theologians like Bonhoeffer and Tillich. And you say, you're going to leave them aside. You're not going to tackle their arguments. You're going to focus on the Jerry Falwells, the Tom Robertsons, the Ayatollah Khomeini's, and the Bin Ladens instead. And you proceed to do what I think is a very witty and often splendid and important insight in demolishing these cultic aspects of religion. <laughs> Though, of course, you have predicated it by setting aside the sophisticated side. But can I put a personal point to you? that it seems to me that you then go on and create a kind of cult out of atheism itself. And your own website, richarddawkins.net, with its merchandising section in particular demonstrates this, where you've got the entire iconography of atheism on sale, including a choice of T-shirts and even two <laughs> different <laughs> Richard Dawkins can car I, bumper stickers. Can I draw what you to a close? That? That's it. Richard, you started yes. a cult. Um, well, <laughs> Okay. Um, first, I, I, I hasten to say that the, that the merchandising is, is, is all in, in aid of, of the foundation. None of it goes to me. I mean, I, I, I need to, to, say, to say that. Um, the point about Tillich and Bonhoeffer and, uh, and um, attacking the easy targets like Jerry Falwell, I wish that all religious people were like Tillich and Bonhoeffer. I wouldn't have bothered to write the book if they were. Um, but unfortunately, the huge majority of religious people in the world, not just Christians, but Muslims and, and, and others as well, wouldn't have the faintest clue what Tillich and Bonhoeffer are talking about. What they like is the Bible or the Koran, whatever it is. They take it literally, um, and it's no good saying, oh, that's not my kind of Christianity. Well, fine, it's not your kind of Christianity, but I didn't write the book for you. I wrote the book for the vast majority of religious people who naively believe in the Bible or the Quran or, or whatever it is. Now, I would genuinely like to have, probably not now, but there won't be time, but to have a conversation with uh, somebody who, is, who follows Tillich and Bonhoeffer to hear what they really, really do think. I would be interested in that, in that argument. I've never actually heard a sophisticated theologian say anything that I regarded as worth discussing, to be quite honest, but I, I'm re always ready to be disabused of that. Meanwhile, my hands are full dealing with the Jerry Falwells of this world, who are hugely influential, hugely rich, and who have vast followings in the United States and elsewhere. Okay, we're taking a question from the gentleman at the back there. Um, I'd like to hear your views on uh, ab the most abstract reaches of mathematics um, and why that tells us anything about the world. As far as I can see, um, maths probably uh, it didn't need to be very sophisticated to, to allow us to evolve in terms of survival. It wasn't particularly attractive in the mating game, as far as I can tell from the abstract mathematicians that I know now. <laughs> um, but when Einstein went out into the most extraordinary reaches, which are purely internal in the brain, as far as I can tell, see, he came, the result came back to E equals mc squared, and he split the atom. Now, why should there be that connection there? that this is not in any way a pro-religious point. It's just something that fascinates me. Well, I think you're, there are two questions which you could be asking. What, I thought at first you were saying a question that Einstein himself, I think, asked, which was, why is the universe intelligible mathematically? And other people have asked that. What is it about um, mathematics that makes it um, the, 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 the explanation of the universe? But the other question, which I think you actually were asking, was what is the advantage to humans 
of having mathematical understanding. Why would natural selection? You pointed out that mathematicians don't seem to be particularly, I don't know why you say that, particularly <laughs> good at um, attracting mates. Um, uh, so, so what is the biological advantage of having a mathematical brain? Um, I share your puzzlement, but it's not just mathematics. It's also poetry, it's music, it's art, it's all kinds of things which clearly separate humans off from all other animals and seem to separate humans off from all at least naive interpretations of Darwinism. Now, my own rather lame attempt to understand this is to say that uh, something about natural selection gave us big brains, 